Sue Ann Fort, and I'm the Program Manager for International Programs at the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies. Our central goal at the Institute is to foster excellence in basic and advanced research in an interdisciplinary research environment. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Colin Ware, who has joined the Peter Wall Institute as an International Visiting Research Scholar. The mandate of our International Visiting Research Scholar Program is to work with UBC faculties, departments, and research centers to bring outstanding international scholars to UBC to work collaboratively on innovative research. If you'd like to learn more about the Institute, you can sign up for our newsletter at the end of the uh, lecture. I would like to thank the Department of Computer Science and Dr. Tamara Munzner, who is hosting Dr. Ware while he's visiting here. And I would like now to call upon uh, Dr. Munzner to introduce Dr. Ware. Hi, thanks. Uh, so hi, I'm Tamara Munzner uh, here at Computer Science, um, and it is my great pleasure uh, that Colin Ware is joining us. Um, Colin is actually visiting for the entire month. This talk is about halfway through that, so if folks are interested in meeting with him, he'll be in town till about, uh, I believe, March 22nd, and you can either let me know or let him know to set up a meeting. Um, I've known Colin for at least, I don't know, 15 years, maybe more like 20, somewhere in there. Um, he's currently a professor at the University of New Hampshire, where he's been for quite a long time. Um, he's head of the Data Visualization Research Lab, um, and has been heavily involved in the domain area of ocean mapping. So actually, that lab is affiliated with their Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. Um, Colin has a very interesting background in that he's got degrees both from the computer science side and also the perceptual psychology side, with advanced degrees from both Waterloo and Toronto. Um, and what many people probably know Colin the most for is that he literally did write the book. Um, that is, his book is the textbook that is by far the most heavily used in the field of information visualization. Um, I've used it myself for many, many, many years. Um, he's also written another book because an even broader book on visual thinking for design um, is something that's uh, of interest to people in a large variety of fields. Um, and uh, so that's a more recent book, whereas uh, the big info of his textbook is now already on its third edition. Um, in terms of what Colin is maybe the best known for, it's really this marriage of ideas from perceptual psychology for the design and the evaluation of visualization system, particularly the careful characterization of how humans respond to visualization techniques. Um, so uh, a lot of his work has been highly influential, both design and evaluation of systems. Um, so what I'm completely delighted is that he's here for the month to talk to people. Um, he's doing a mix of talking to folks here at UBC, also um, at SEAT. Um, so he's been jumping around a lot back and forth between people doing visualization, visual analytics, um, and perception issues more broadly. So Colin, thank you so much for coming, and I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Tamara. I think Tamara's book, when it, when it comes out, will uh, wipe my book off the market. So uh, a lot of thinking these days goes on kind of like this. Right? Certainly the, I spend a lot of uh, my time sitting there in front of a com uh, computer and, and some of the things are going on in the person's head and some of the things are going on in the, com in the computer. Uh, uh, well, the first PC application, the kind of killer app, was in fact uh, the spreadsheet, but the spreadsheet plus a plot, a graph. So, a businessman sits down with a spreadsheet which has a simple model of their business, how much the costs are, projected sales, all those kinds of things, and they can tweak different variables um, and come up with some kind of um, profit projection. Um, the key thing about that is that the, the graph, the profit projection comes out as a graph, so there's a visual feedback from the computer, and that's the kind of scenario I'm talking about. But it's not, it's not just in that kind of uh, numerical analytics. Uh, it occurs, obviously, with people who use maps, people who do computer-aided design, uh, and, and many other fields. That uh, We have this kind of distributed process where you have a, a visual interface to um, applications, which are, in, some, in a sense, encoded thoughts from a whole lot of people, and um, something going on in a, an, a, a person's head. So this is a sort of expanded view of that, that, that sketch. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, the idea of uh, visual thinking design patterns. So design patterns 
uh, originally came from the field of architecture, a guy called Christopher Alexander, um, expressed kind of design concepts, design concepts that work. Um, I, I know they're disputed by architects, or their value is disputed by architects, but, um, so, so, uh, uh, um, but still, they've been highly influential. Uh, uh, I guess a canonical example of a design pattern in, in, in architecture would be the uh, sink, stove, uh, refrigerator triangle in, in a kitchen layout. Right, so that's kind of it's, so they capture something that is known to work, and, and even though you may not exactly choose to go with it, it kind of it, it gives you a starting point. Uh, the design patterns have also been very influential in uh, software engineering, uh, where they kind of capture bigger chunks of design, bigger chunks than say data structures or abstract data types, which is an encapsulation of data with a set of operations on the data. Uh, a design pattern in software engineering gives you something say that can, I don't know, deliver data objects over the internet or something. It's a, it's a proven way of doing something that again, is not, it's not actually a, a software module, but it is a, a, work, it's a solution that knows, that is known to work and has uh, been field tested as it were. So. What I've been concerned with, uh, as Tamara said, I've spent most of my career trying to, well, in some sense, uh, grubbing around at the low level, trying to figure out how to use color to display whatever um, color-coded maps and how to design symbols and how to use textures and all of those kinds of things. But um, really, visual thinking is a process, and, and I don't think we have a language for describing that process, because in, on the left-hand side of this, we have the language of cognitive science. On the right-hand side, we have the language of computer science. And um, we need some way of describing these kinds of systems. Um, and I, well, I, I'm going to be describing them in kind of rough and ready languages, which is what design patterns are, in a way that I hope that can be used by designers in the in the, the ongoing design process. So I just want to uh, describe this uh, thing that I'm that, that is a kind of simplified view of this, this, this thinking machine. So it's a, sim, a, a thinking machine with human and computer components in it. On the left-hand side, we have what's called the visualization pipeline. Uh, typically, data, often a lot of it, um, is uh, some part of it is brought in, perhaps through some filtering operation, into a local cache. And then it's mapped onto a, a graphical display, uh, say a network diagram or some kind of map diagram or whatever. Um, and um, then it appears in a visualization, so it appears on the screen. Um, on the human side, the, we, the, uh, the eyeball, of course, um, takes in the information uh, to the receptors, goes to a patent processing stage. But the patent processing that, that goes on is not a, just a registration of the information. It, it, it depends ex uh, to a very great extent on what we want to find, right? We don't, we don't see just sort of everything. We see what we want to see to, um, to deal with whatever cognitive, ongoing cognitive task we have. And that's sort of captured in this scheme by what I'm calling a visual query. And, and I'll expand on that later, but that's basically a visual query is some, uh, <coughs> some construct that, that's cognitively formulated um, which, which is a visual pattern. So it's, it's some aspect of a problem I've turned into a visual pattern search. So if I find this pattern, it'll help me solve the, some problem I'm interested in. Um, <clears throat> visual working memory is key, and I'll expand on that. That's a key bottleneck in, in, in these kinds of systems. Uh, another term is epistemic actions, which I borrowed from um, David Kuris and others. Um, so this is uh, the idea of uh, actions to take to acquire knowledge. For example, an eye movement, right? That, that's the most simple uh, kind of epistemic action I can have. So if I, if I want to get more information about something that's over there, I look over there. Um, but uh, in information visualization, people have invented all kinds of uh, uh, nice techniques which um, help uh, the analytic process. So, for example, clicking on a, an item will open it up and, and show it in more detail. People who know, who know this field will have heard about things like brushing um, and um, dynamic queries. So, that those are sort of other examples. Okay, so now I want to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand on some of those ideas and then I'm going to run through a set of examples from, from the work in my lab. So just to expand on the idea of a visual query, uh, we can 
somebody who's interested in analyzing social networks, maybe somebody in law enforcement, might want to know how did the information get from Mark to Brianna. And if they have this thinking tool, a, a social network diagram, so a social network diagram is a diagram with, where, where the nodes in this are people and the links between them represent communications, might be uh, telephone calls or conversations or, or whatever, tweets. Um, then if you have a diagram like this, the, the visual queries, well, there will be a, a, a kind of a, a series of visual queries. The first visual query would be to find Brianna, the node, the graphical symbol representing Brianna. Then there'd be another query to find the node representing Mark. And then the, the key part of this is finding the, the pattern of links between the, those. And if, if we found that, that pattern, then we have the answer. At least we have a potential answer, um, at least as good as our data can give us. You know, it, there, there may be other pathways we don't know about, but if that's what we have and that's what's represented. I visually solved that problem. Uh, going to uh, an, another example, something we've been working on a lot, I'm in an ocean mapping center, so uh, one of the things we're interested in is our ocean currents. Um, and this work stemmed from the observation that most uh, current and ocean current and wind displays are, are actually very poor. This is something from UC San Diego, and it shows uh, data from uh, high-frequency radar, and it shows um, the current. So the, in this case, the, 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 the problem is uh, that I may be interested in is you know, just what direction is the current flowing in a particular place, how fast is the current flowing, and I might also be interested in structures in the currents, like eddies. Well, could I do better than this? So can I, um, part of the idea is a visual queries is a way of translating um, problem tasks, so tasks I need to solve into, into uh, the, transforming them in, into uh, uh, representation problems. So can I uh, then, uh, so how might I solve this in terms of the representation? This is a study by David Laidlaw in 2001 where he evaluated um, these different visualization, grid of little arrows, so that's the little arrow solution, jitter grid of little arrows, this um, triangle thing that he invented, something called line integral convolution, which um, was kind of the darling of the scientific visualization world for a while until people realized it didn't actually work very well. Um, and this one, which is uh, head to tail little arrows, which actually won, and, uh, uh, won, at least for one of his tasks, which is if I drop a particle, where is it going to go? And this, this particular representation on the lower right was a uh, was the winner. Um, we've been um, uh, continuing that research to try and put some real perceptual theory into it. So, you know, if I have any representation, what can I say perceptually about uh, about why that might be good, or, or also uh, why any other scheme might be good or bad? And uh, we took as our basic premise that in, for a good flow visualization, you want the um, well, in, in the primary visual cortex, this is the back of the first stage of major stage of visual processing at the back of the brain. There are literally several billion neurons, and um, a large percentage of them are actually sensitive to orientation. So the argument we made was that a good flow representation should have as many as possible of those orientation detectors responding tangentially to the flow. So it seems like a sort of reasonable argument. You, you don't want your orientation detectors uh, orthogonal to the flow or, or 45 degrees to the flow. You want them tangential to the flow. And, and a, a PhD student of mine, Dan Pinio, actually modeled the visual cortex um, with a computer model, um, simulated a, a million neurons, a, 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 about a billion connections between them, all on the GPU, very cool. Um, and uh, simulated this advection task. So the, what you're seeing there is this lower right representation as a process through this model of the primary visual cortex. These are hypercolumns. And so it's able to now to put a um, real solid kind of perceptual theory behind this. Um, I don't want to belabor that because it's kind of a little bit of off, off topic, but I, I, I wanted to illustrate how we can kind of drill right down into the representation problem and, and use uh, uh, results from neuropsychology to um, make arguments about design. 
Um, we can also um, point out about if, if I have arrows, then one of the things that arrows do is they give me orientation, but I also need the arrowhead to tell me which direction is, for, is going with respect to that particular contour. Is it going from right to left or left to right? And a, a possible mechanism for that will be end stop neurons. And if that is the mechanism, then these alternative designs in the lower right here um, will actually give you much, a much stronger signal because they have much greater asymmetry along the path. Um, and this was obviously, well, when this is a student of mine, David Fowler, and I did this study, but sort of pre-theory. <laughs> the theory we, we only developed much more recently than that. Um, and also Ed, Edmund Halley in 1868 <laughs> also thought this might be a good idea. Uh, and this line of research eventually led to uh, this display here, which is something which is uh, using our software to display uh, ocean current maps uh, of the uh, Pacific. And the, uh, these are actually different ocean mo models uh, um, displayed uh, using the, uh, the, the basic concepts that we derived from well, both, both take into account theory. I, you can see these head-to-tail little strings of arrows which, uh, and, and some aspects of design, too. OK, so that's kind of the visual query. The visual query in this scheme is what should drive. You need to somehow break down the task into things which you can, uh, you can uh, discover, uh, which, where the solution can be discovered through some kind of visual pattern search and then you need to optimize the display to support those pattern searches. Um, next thing I want to talk about uh, is visual working memory. Um, so if I show you those two things, then you probably feel you more or less instantaneously see them, they're the same, although it actually would take you a, 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 a few hundred milliseconds and it'll take you a little longer to see those that are actually different. But what about this? If I show you this, then I blank the screen for literally half a second, then um, probably about half of you will um, think they're the same. But actually, they're not. Um, the triangle there, the colors at the end, so the triangle there is blue, it's yellow there. So that's kind of illustrating the kind of limits of, of working memory. This is just, just at the edge of what <laughs> working memory can encompass. And this has actually really profound uh, um, implications uh, for perception. Um, Ron here, I think, um, did you coin the term change blindness? But yeah, OK, so he coined the term change blindness. So one of the corollaries of this is, is that, in fact, we're actually, we're actually blind to major changes in the world if they happen with, with a blink or some kind of something to kind of hide the transition. Um, um, other corollaries are that we really do not see very much of the world, right? Um, we, uh, and the, the, the impression that we, that we see the world in rich detail is actually an, illu an illusion. Um, the reality is, and, and hundreds of studies support this, it's uh, um, certainly not, my, not me saying this, um, that we get, we, we have this illusion and, and we can sustain this illusion that we see the world in, in rich detail because we can make eye movements. So as soon as we want something, we can have it. So we feel that all this detail is at our, at our sort of mental fingertips. It's actually not, but we can get it so quickly in cognitive terms with eye movements that in fact we have this, we, we can sustain this illusion. Okay, so that actually is several chunks of, of visual working memory capacity. Um, a little bit more about epistemic action, so action is to execute, to seek knowledge. And what, what I'm trying to capture here is relatively simple action. So not, I mean, there are epistemic actions like a Google search. You know, you type in some keywords, it comes back with all this stuff, and then you start going through the stuff. That, that indeed, at least I, I think, is a, a, as an epistemic action, but it's not the kind of thing I want to try and capture. Um, I want to capture things where there's fairly simple computations going on and simple changes in the mapping between the data and the display. Um, here's an example. Um, uh, is, uh, this is a system, this little screenshot down here is from a system called, called Flatermouse, which is something that uh, my students and I developed uh, more than 20 years ago and which is, was spun off as a product and is now widely used in oceanography. 
the epistemic action that we designed in this is because it's used by geologists, and geologists like to see profiles. Um, so this is a map of, from multi-beam sonar of the seafloor. Um, in this system, you can, we made it very easy to get a profile. So you can just drag your cursor over the, 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 what you see on the screen at any time, and um, it'll generate this profile. That's something they like to do, and so we, we made that easy. And again, the eye movements are the kind of um, basic epistemic action. And, and this is meant to sort of reinforce this idea that we don't see very much. We only see detail in the center of the visual field, in, in the fovea, uh, where we can see extreme detail. Um, but out of the edge of the visual field, we can only sort of kind of see things the size of a football. And we have to you know, use eye movements to go around and pick up the information. OK, so that's enough of the, the kind of background. Um, so now I want to run through a set of examples uh, kind of to develop this idea of visual thinking design patterns. And the first one I, I want to talk about is tools for finding new underwater behaviors from humpback whale tag data. And, and the reason why, why I, one reason why I want to start with this is because this is where, in some sense, it all started with me. Because the first solution uh, um, that we came up with to this problem turned out to be lousy. And uh, then, I came up with another solution, and it turned out to be much better. And I really started thinking, well, you know, why, why was the first one so bad? Why, you know, what would it take to have gotten to the second one first instead of you know, wasting all the time on the first one? Uh, so just to give you a little background on the project, um, <clears throat> so the the data that that we were presented with, uh, this is Roland Arseno mostly, and Matt Plumley and myself was data from this tag. So this is a tag that uh, uh, developed by Mark Johnson at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, you stick it onto a whale with uh, uh, the suction cups, and you follow it around with this big boat. Um, and it contains basically the same set of instruments you have in a self, um, an iPhone. So it has accelerometers, magnetometers, and pressure. So if you think of a touch screen as being pressure. Although this thing costs about $20,000. so. It's a little bit more expensive, even on an expensive iPhone. Um, I was, I, I mean, I still always uh, kind of uh, can't believe how fortunate I was getting involved in this cruise, because this project's been so much fun. Um, but, but why I was so unfortunate is because I, I, we literally had this technology um, in the first year it was ever deployed. So it had been built the, the year before, and we, you know, I was part of the first crews to ever attach these things to uh, humpback whales. So we were getting the first kind of pictures in some sense. I mean, people had attached tags to humpback whales before, but they were basic, simpler things like time and depth recorders. So on this tag's quite a bit more, more um, sophisticated. So this is how you get it on the, the, the animal <laughs> with a long pole. And there you can see it's actually just been put on the animal. If you look carefully, you can see it there stuck onto the back of a whale. So thinking about this, um, part of the idea of visual thinking design patterns to th is to think of the thinking process and, and, and to be able to capture and describe in, in simple pseudocode that, that, that process. So, so if you have unknown data, uh, at least, and, and this, this really is kind of basic discovery science, nobody knew what humpback whales um, did underwater, um, you're, you're interested in finding stereotyped patterns. And really, anything will do. You, 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 if and a whale does something peculiar once, it, you know, who knows? It might have just had an itch or something. You, don't, you have no idea what it means. But if it does something peculiar many times, then it's probably significant. If, if many whales do the, same do the same thing many times, then, it, it's, then you get even more interested. So what we want to find is stereotype patterns. So the process is, uh, in general, just in abstract, is re repeat, review the behavior sequence, looking for patterns. Try and remember, if you think you found a pattern, remember it somehow, and then look for more instances until you've got no new patterns. So the first solution was a system called GeoZui. Uh, we applied, this actually is what got us into it. I'm going to show you that now, um, which is hopefully still running in background. There it is. Um, so actually, this is the, the, the story of this is we built this system called GeoZui 4D. It stands for Geographic Zooming User Interface 4D, so, it, so it's got nice it zooms. 
Um, um, and um, we built it, but at least in my center, nobody had any interesting data that was really sort of time varying and spatial. So, we, so I, I went to Woods Hole and gave this presentation and basically said, hey, has anyone here got any interesting data? We're, we're interested in working with you. And, and this guy, Dave Wiley, who's the chief scientist on this program of research, um, took us up on it. And so we got to go out on this first cruise. And so here we are. Here's the tracks of, um, well, various things, ships and whales and so on. So um, we were actually, in, oh, they were interested in whale, how, whether whales avoid whale watching boats, which turned out to be a, a bit of a disaster because um, we were supposed to be over here where there were a set of hydrophones from Cornell and there were no, that particular year, the whales weren't there. And so the whale, watch, the whale watching boats weren't there either. And um, where we ended, we ended up going down here, we had a big ship so we kind of go, wanted, could go where we want, but there were no whale watching boats, but there were at least some, uh, some fishing boats. Okay, so let's see if I can find a whale. So as you can see, I can zoom in here and I can zoom in and I can zoom in and find a whale. I can do all kinds of, um, I can play, so I can kind of replay the track and I can, this does all kinds of cool things, um, so um, like, you, you may not have noticed, but as soon as I clicked on that whale, I went into its frame of reference. So I can click on it, and I'm now in, in, immediately in its frame of reference. And I can do all kinds of things. I can add extra windows to it. And um, I'm just going to stop that now. And we added this um, construct. Well, I'll show you. We added tools for analysis. So, um, oh, I know where, how we get that there. OK, so we added uh, this idea that we call space-time notes, which, is, which was specifically for analysts. So the idea is um, if someone sees something interesting, you can capture it. And, and it'll take you there. And um, let me, um, I can annotate it. This it doesn't have any codes, but we had support for coding it in various ways and adding notes and so on. And my sound's not turned on for some reason, but if it was, you, oh, maybe if I, there you go. You can even listen. So, um, they absolutely loved it, um, um, but um, some poor hapless graduate students tried to use it for analysis. You know, they uh, spent a long time kind of going through these tracks and trying to figure out what the behaviors were, but eventually they basically abandoned it, so they didn't. Um, it did get used, mind you, I mean, it got used um, and this is why they invited us back the next year. But it got used uh, by Dave Wiley because uh, a lot of the research there has to do with policy. And they were really interested in the fact that, uh, well, there's a, a major problem with whales and they get entangled in fishing gear. And so this could produce nice movies. So it has the ability to save movies. And you can see, in fact, that these animals are down foraging near the bottom, spending all their time, which nobody knew before, down near the bottom where they're going to get entangled in fishing gear. So it became a very powerful tool to, to um, try and get people to uh, adapt the fishing gear, and there has been some progress along those ways. But it was not used for analysis, which is what we were aiming for. So now I'll go back to the slides. And if we think about this uh, process, so what do you do? How do you execute this process? Well, you repeat. You review the, the behavior sequence looking for patterns by playbacks. OK, so you have to replay what's going on, and you remember patterns. Well, it's actually very hard to remember these kind of just the whale kind of jiggling around in some peculiar way. It just doesn't stick in your mind. Um, but if you do see it, then you, you can use the space-time nodes to capture it. And then you look for more instances. But I, I, I put this up, may involve reviewing all other whale tracks. So even if you're, say, three quarters of the way through and you find some new behavior um, that this be animal's doing, then well, you really have to go back and look at all the other guys again and to see if it was in there and you'd missed it. You know, there may be a, maybe this guy's doing it a lot and there's other animals who are only doing it occasionally and you missed it. So it really is extremely time consuming. If you've got 24 hours, at least tax down for about 24 hours, you can speed it up, but it's still going to take you at least eight hours to analyze one animal kind of at the first pass. So it takes, a, you, know, it takes you a long time to, uh, to, to deal with the data. And um, people abandoned it. So the second attempt, though, was, was with, um, and I'm not going to show you the actual software this time. These are just images. So um, the, this is um, some software which 
I developed called Trackplot, and, and it's specifically designed for this tag data. So the, the, uh, there's a few things. One is it's totally track oriented, so you navigate along the track. Another is, the tr and this is the, probably the key thing here, is just the transformation of the track into this ribbon. So just to show you, this, this is showing the surface the animal's on the surface here, it's on the bottom here, it's rolling, the, so color-coded rolls more than 45 degrees, and you can see these periodic um, rolls of, of a standard uh, duration, and you can also see these sawtooth patterns on the track, and that's uh, the track um, differentiated about a lateral axis, which um, turns out, it turns out that even though we didn't really have control about where the, where the um, tag was placed on the animal, but nevertheless, we always got a good signature uh, like that, and that, that's fluking, right? These animals fluke vertically, so if you take a lateral axis and the animal coordinates, you'll get fluking. And so this is, these things have a periodicity of about uh, four or five seconds, which is about the fluking interval for a humpback whale, typically. Um, just to show you some more examples, here's uh, the same kind of behavior, but embedded in these straight lines. Um, Here's the same behavior again. These are side rolls again with fairly standardized durations on the bottom. This is actually, we've only finally uh, just, just uh, uh, a few weeks ago sent off this paper because this, nobody, nobody knew that humpbacks fed on the bottom. Um, and we still don't really know what they're doing, but um, people have described midwater feeding, surface feeding, but never bottom feeding. Um, so this is actually quite exciting. They're spending more of their time doing this than anything else there. Um, and these are bursting guys swimming, so you can just see how, the, how ni nicely this picks up these kinds of behaviors. Um, this is the breathing patterns on the surface, short dives, um, take a breath, short dive, take a breath for a couple of minutes, then dive, deep dive to the bottom. These are, uh, we have a paper out on uh, uh, different kinds of bubble net feedings. This is this spectacular behavior where they swim around in a circle, uh, blowing bubbles, which creates a net which traps the fish, and then they then they come up, then they come up um, and engulf uh, a large volume of water with the fish in it and, and expel it through the baleen. And we um, through this kind of analysis classified this into two major kinds, whether or, basically whether or not they have this little loop in, in, involved, which is a, what's called a lobtail lunge loop. So they slap the water with their tail, and then they go down a, in, in a second loop and come up like this. Um, so this is actually, this, is, this, this shows you an actual bubble. If you should look in the foreground there, I guess that's pretty good. You can see that. So there's a bubble ring there. So this guy's, um, and you can actually see that's, that's a sand lance, and that's a sand lance. That's what these, are, these are particular whales are feeding on. It's these short little eely things, which are about five inches long. Um, some places they feed on quill, some places they feed on small herring. Okay, so this thing they do use, um, and I, I, well, it started off with me using it, but, um, but, but now it's out there and people are, quite a few people are using it around the world. So why does it work? Well, the key thing is, you review the behavior sequence looking for patterns using eye movements because you can, you can actually see a big chunk. If, if Going back to this slide, that's actually several hours of behavior. So now all of a sudden I'm, I'm seeing, you know, uh, a good chunk of a, of a, well, typically they'll only be foraging maybe for six or, six or eight hours. So I'm seeing a good chunk of that particular foraging behavior all at once. And because, and this is key, because there is a good translation between the behavior and the visual representation, so the visual representation here actually captures most of what's important, and that's why it works. So I can simply just move my eyes around and pick up and say, hey, there's a whole bunch of the same kind of patterns in there. Um, for in terms of remembering things, or track plot lets you save little thumbnails, which you can then uh, post on the wall um, until no new, mat no new patterns. So now you're using eye movements and visual working memory, how they're, how they're meant to be used, how, the, how they can be used efficiently. So literally from one half second to the next, I can just dart around and pick up those patterns and see what's the same and what's different. So th there's an enormous gain in efficiency from, from many, many hours or, or even days to a few minutes. I mean, literally with, the, with this tool, within half an hour of uh, the data coming back, we have a pretty good idea if this guy's doing something new um, or if it's doing something we saw last year or, or whatever. Um, um, so. It's, this is not, of course, the whole story in analysis. There's still detailed analysis that gets done after the fact, but this actually is certainly the first stage. 
and, it, and it, sometimes it changes the strategy of how, you know, what, what kind of animals we're going to go after the next day. Um, been quite productive in terms of papers. These are just the ones that I've been involved in, but there are quite a lot more now. Okay, second example. Um, so degree of relevance highlighting. This is a, a social network diagram. It uh, is useful for reasoning about um, links between people. So you probably can't read the labels here, but the labels are people's names, and the connections are things through uh, are through organizations. So some of them are uh, related to, well, there's a party link, there's a poetry, some kind of poetry group link, and so there's just various kinds of links between these individuals. Um, this is all fine, and, 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 and these things work very well, but, but they do not work very well when, they, when you get beyond, say, 30, 30 nodes or so, and, and some similar number of links, right? They just become tangles, and you can't, uh, you can't do anything with them. So on the right here, you're seeing something which is a, several hundred nodes, and, and uh, there aren't any labels there, but you couldn't see if there were labels, so it's completely hopeless. So um, this is some work I did with um, um, Rusty Barbro at BBN, um, and it uh, takes advantage of an idea from Tamara, and uh, the, in the system she had developed called Constellation. And um, I'm going to actually uh, demonstrate this as well. So I think it's a useful example of the visual thinking process. So we did some studies. Uh, <coughs> we did some formal studies of measuring people's eye movements while they perform tasks. Okay, so you so you look at this. Of course, you, you the, the notes aren't labeled. But the, the idea of, um, degree of what I'm calling degree of relevance highlighting is I can click on nodes and now see everything two links away. And the reason why that works, oh, let me just explain what the graph is. This is the, um, this, this network diagram shows Fortune 500 companies. There's a, something like 500 nodes in here. There's, I think, about 300 companies and a whole bunch of, um, I don't know, 150 gray nodes. The gray nodes are people, are the connections between these companies. So they're people on more than one board. And you probably can't read that, but that's. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you'll be able to read it then either, but you might, it, it might help. Um, so you're seeing somebody called Edward Liddy there, whoops, so the, um, who's on the board of Goldman Sachs and on the board of um, 3M and on the board of um, whatever, Allstate, I guess. So it's on three boards. So this allows you to explore this. United Technologies has um, um, Frank Popoff on the board, and he's also on the board of Quest Communications. and. And United Technologies is also linked to last it. Um, anyway, so this allows you to um, to rapidly explore this, um, not as rapidly as just with eye movements, but still pretty fast. And um, so we did studies of this. So just just to be clear again, what you're seeing is um, color coded nodes are companies color coded by industry sector. So red is finance, orange is transportation, and so on. Um, gray nodes are individuals who are on the board of more than one company. And we um, ran studies where the task was, well, we did a bunch of tasks, but one particular task I'm going to show you was ask someone the question is, which uh, company in the transportation sector is best connected to the finance sector through board of director links? OK, so I'm going to now load um, and play back some, some of the subjects. Um, behavior. OK. So what you're going to be seeing, I'm going to push play. And what you're seeing now is their mouse movements and their eye movements. And I'm actually going to slow this down. So that what you were seeing is real time. Now it's one third speed. So this is visual thinking. Of, oh my god, that doesn't actually look too good. Um, yeah. So you can't see this as well as you should be able to. So you're seeing it at one third speed. It's not good either. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. So, oh, you can't see the eye movements at all, right? Oh dear. 
Is it the brightness is low? The it's something to do with the gamma or something, but there's a, there should be a yellow circle moving around here. I'm glad I came back and looked because I would have been saying all these things and you'd say, what are you talking about? Um, because you should be able to see the eye movements. And I really wanted to see, you'd be able to see the interplay between eye movements and um, mouse selections, but you absolutely can't see those. So sorry about that. Um, in fact, that was kind of the whole point of this demo. <laughs> so um, I clear as daylight here. Anyway, I'm just going to have to kill this because it's not, um, not probably that useful. Um, it really does. Uh, I, the, the neat thing about watching their eye movements is you really, you know, in some cases, you can literally see what they're thinking. You can, you know, you can see that somebody was counting the nodes in some place and so on. So be sure. OK, well, that was too bad. But anyway, I'll go on. You saw the whales. <laughs> OK, so the process of um, uh, the process in this case, and you can see that. Uh, I notice that you won't be able to see anything. Uh, See that. So, so this is a description of the process in pseudocode. You construct a visual query to find a symbol that may lead to some useful information. Um, uh, people only do card call this information sent, and it's actually absolutely key in designing these kinds of things because you know if all the nodes are the same color, you, you you know you have to click on every single one, and there's not much to be gained. Uh, there's only a little. You, Ideally, you'd have more information sent. So the, the nodes, for example, could have different sizes based on the um, market capitalization or whatever. Um, can execute an epistemic action by selecting a symbol. So I select the symbol. The computer highlights all symbols with a high degree of relevance to the selected symbol. That was the highlighting of uh, short um, paths. And, and again, the reason why short paths are work, or why this whole technique works, is because you care about short paths, and you don't care about long paths. In social networks, you can get to anybody else with six, <laughs> with six links, anybody else in the whole world. So that's really not generally interesting. You, you generally are interested in short paths. And then you execute a visual pattern query among the highlighted symbols, which is what I'd hope to uh, show you. And. Um, if you find something really high relevance, then you execute an epistemic action to drill down. Now, that I didn't show you, but you sort of cl double click on a node and get more information and so on. So that's kind of how the process works. Um, again, I'm arguing this is a, a kind of a technique that we know works. And what it buys us is we can, we can characterize it. We know about how long the, the actions take. Um, what it buys us is to get from that 30 node problem to the, the sort of 500 node problem. Um, it also does other things, like a lot of people in, in, in the field of graph visualization spend all their time worrying about how to lay out the links between the nodes. But in this case, you don't care. You can, or at least you can pay much less attention to it. So of course, you, you're just getting them interactively through highlighting. OK, third example. Um, so uh, this is something with uh, Matt Plumley, uh, P another PhD student of mine. Um, and this was a, a, a much more explicitly cognitive study. And we were interested in the problem of uh, finding, uh, so this is spatial rather than time. But in, in many, many problems in data visualization, you are characterized as sort of islands of information um, in, in a kind of information desert. Information tends to be clustered. And so we're interested in somehow finding those islands and often comparing them. <coughs> so. Uh, in this case, we were interested in the visual working memory involvement. And we constructed this artificial task. But I, I hope that you'll well agree that it reflects sort of real tasks. So that we, you know, when you do these uh, formal studies, you have to simplify a whole lot. And this is what we simplified it to. So you can see those shapes up there, right? So there's, there's a bunch of shapes. There's uh, cones and disks and uh, uh, rectangular boxes and, and spheres. And um, the task was to say, is this collection of whatever it is, seven objects the same as this collection. And you can probably see that this one's different because there's a, uh, a dark blue one there, and it's a light blue here, and everyone else is the same. Uh, all this stuff in the background was just uh, deliberately introduced visual noise so that you couldn't just do it by looking at a few pixels. So these are magnifying windows 
And the islands of information here are, uh, at, at these points here. So those are the islands. And we were looking at zooming versus using magnifying windows. So one solution to the problem of, of small um, islands of information is, is what people call um, zooies. Uh, th that is an acronym for zoom, zooming user interfaces. So Ben Bateson and others made this um, thing that allows you to really make zooming into very easy, right? So you can easily zoom in and zoom out and zoom in and zoom out and do that. And that's one way of solving this problem. Um, but um, another way of doing it is, is using extra windows. So I can put these magnifying glasses over different points and, and the key thing is now I can just make eye movements back and forward. So there are greater costs now to actually getting, uh, getting to this focus, right? If I could just zoom in on that, say that little point there, that would probably be quicker than moving this here. But, but if I have to make the comparison, then we'll, we'll see the trade-off trade with working memory. So now, now to the cognitive model. Um, so the time to perform this task is the setup cost plus the number of visits. And what I mean by a visit is somehow bring, take, bring my attention to bear on some particular part of the display. Um, times the time it takes to you know, sort of get there, how long it takes to zoom or make an eye movement. The number of visits, though, is a function, at least we argued, um, and, and that's what the, the experiment was about, to find out if this was true, was a function of the number of objects to be compared to n visual working memory capacity. So n over m, where n is the number of objects in that little cluster, so there's seven here, and m is the size of visual working memory, say three items. So if I have seven items and I have to zoom back and forward, suppose I can start, so, so I have seven items, I, have to, I can only stuff three into working, visual working memory, I have to zoom over, well, if, Forget about the windows, right, for now. Forget about the windows, think about it as a zooming task. I have to remember three objects, zoom in, um, or, or well, zoom into the first place, remember three objects, zoom out, zoom into the other place, and, and compare them, and then get three more objects, and zoom back again, and so on. Um, take a, a t that's, that's quite difficult, whereas in this case, I can do it with, uh, by planting the windows there, and then making eye movements back and forward. So this is uh, Matt modeled this in great detail um, ahead of time and came up with these predictions. Based, uh, so the reason why these are sort of fuzzy lines is based on different assumptions. But the, the basic point is that zooming should be quicker if you've only got one object. So you probably can't, maybe not read those axes. That says one, two, three, up to eight objects in the clusters. And this is predicted time up to 80 seconds, so zero seconds, 40 seconds, and so on. And zooming should be quicker with a, um, if there's only one object to compare, so I can zoom in, see the object, no problem remembering, zoom out, zoom in somewhere else, say it's the same or different. I don't need to move the little window around. Um, if I do it with multiple windows, there's a higher setup cost, so it's slower initially. But once I get to more objects, then it becomes, there's a trade-off, zooming becomes worse and the multi-window becomes better because now the cost of moving the windows around is the same and, and now eye movements, the eye movement comparisons are much, much faster than the zooming. Is that, is that clear, hopefully? Um, so these are the results which um, closely match the prediction. You see this nice crossover around three items. Although really this, um, just the uh, time, so this is time results, um, that actually understates the, uh, the advantages of having multiple windows when you've got more complicated patterns to remember because these are the error rates down here. So really there are just huge error rates. That's, that's like almost, that's over 40% error rate with seven items with, that's zooming. So the blue bars are zooming. So huge error rates would be completely unacceptable, um, in fact. I mean, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of experiments are not like, the in the real world, you, if you're performing this task, you have to zoom back or forward a lot more times to really check that you've got it, got it right. But, um, so with one object, there's, there's similar and very low error rates. With three objects, you're already starting to see a penalty for, uh, for zooming, but um, with seven objects, it, it, um, there's a huge penalty. Okay, so, um, so anyway, the bottom line here is that you can, you can um, Simply model this. Um, Matt actually did a complicated model, but I believe that you can just have simple rules of thumb. If you have a good feeling for what visual working memory capacity is, then you can immediately come up to, say, a guideline that says, hey, you know, I, I, the, the, uh, the zooming solution is not going to work here because I'm 
trying to make comparisons between patterns that are too complicated and I need some support. And it also generalizes to other things. You know, there's other ways of doing this next to windows. I could, I could take a snapshot and paste it up somewhere. I, you know, you, once you can think about working memory and you understand its properties and understand the task, then I think it, it gives you a basis for reasoning about these problems. Um, OK, so I'm almost uh, done now. So just uh, those are the examples. And I just wanted to sketch out the idea of a design process incorporating this. So um, the idea of visual thinking design patterns is, is really something, um, I mean, I've been working on these ideas of the process for a while, but the idea of design patterns I've only been working on for uh, a couple of years. Um, and uh, I've been working uh, with a company called Oculus in Toronto, who, who, and it's been great because they design a lot of visualizations. Um, and this is a, a DARPA project, which is about rapid uh, what they call agile visualization. So the idea is you have a toolkit of visualization components, they call it Aperture Studio, and then that you can somehow, um, by understanding the visualization, uh, the visual uh, thinking design patterns, you can, um, and understanding the data, and understanding the tasks that you can come up with, good visual um, thinking solutions. So um, this, uh, little whoops, excuse me. This little block of text in the middle on the left there is just meant to uh, um, uh, illustrate some of the kinds of rules. I see it's partly cut off, but that, that we can uh, we think we can come up with that sort of help you in this design process. That if you've got a small network of less than 30 nodes, then you can do a static representation. If you've got a medium-sized graph, say between 30 and 60 nodes, then you can do this um, degree of relevance. Uh, pattern, if you've got a larger graph greater than 600 nodes, then you may need to uh, use dynamic queries, which I haven't really explained, but uh, or, or some other technique. Um, the key thing is that there's no point in getting uh, you know, more on the screen than you can do anything usefully, useful with. Um, what I'm showing down on the left is something that we came up with a, uh, as a, in a sort of design exercise, trying to just um, go through from task to uh, uh, come up with a methodology for actually analyzing Twitter data, and, and here is something that someone else independently came up with, a, with a, as a design solution. I think it's interesting that they have the same components. So you've got a map, you've got uh, these are the, these are time series plots. This is a, remember this on the left is a design sketch. This is an actual implementation. Um, there's a node link diagram representation here, a node link diagram here, um, showing links between um, tweeters. And uh, this is a time series plot. These are time series plots. Uh, so I just want to end by uh, positioning this um, in the kind of space of, of thinking about design tools. Uh, on the left, I've got uh, Julia Childs and the cookbook idea. So Ben Schneiderman is a, a very famous person in uh, human computer interaction and, and visualization research. And he uh, has this mantra that he calls um, sort of overview first and details on demand, which is sort of basically exhorting people to give, give overviews and then allow people to drill down and see details. Um, but it's not, I mean, that's not particularly cognitive, right? There's nothing cognitive in there. It's, it's, it's probably a, um, maybe a good general, very general design guideline. On the right-hand side, I've got something called ACTAR, which is uh, developed by Anderson. And that's an extremely uh, powerful um, and complex cognitive simu simulation language that allows, that has things like timings for visual working memory operations. In fact, timing, timings for sort of cognitive operations, also timings for things like mouse movements or eye movements and so on. So, the, so in some sense, ACTAR, you, you might think, is the answer. It's way more sophisticated than what I'm talking about. The trouble with ACTAR, though, is if I want to test a design using ACTAR, well, for one thing, it'll take me a year to learn ACTAR. But the other thing is it'll take, you have to program the kind of com the human side of the design in ACTAR. You also have to program your own design. And, and then you have to test, you know, you have to kind of run this joint simulation with your own uh, application against ACTAR. This is completely antithetical to sort of design as it occurs in the real world, where people get together in groups and, you know, trying to, trying to come up with design solutions. Um, it's, it's certainly uh, antithetical to um, agile, you know, getting solutions out in a couple of weeks. Um, so 
although I admire this kind of work, I, I don't think it's the kind of so, uh, solution to the design problem. Um, so visual thinking design patterns are kind of um, somewhat to the right of um, the cookbook approach. Um, and it may be indeed that the cookbook approach is right, it just needs to be more elaborate. Um, so that the jury's out on that. I guess I, I like to think that kind of knowing something about the, the perceptual and cognitive mechanisms really is useful. Um, but you can't expect people to know too much. You know, you can't expect to sp them to spend years of their lives kind of understanding um, uh, perception and cognition in detail than they're, they're designers. So they have to, and they have a lot of other things to worry about. All right, so some of this stuff appears in the third edition of my book, Information and Visualization, Perception for Design, although I'm not talking about visual thinking design patterns there. That came out last year. Uh, funding from DARPA, um, NSF, no, actually, actually some of this research I talked about was um, well, 13 years ago. I was back in Canada and so the National Science Foundation. And, uh, thanks to the uh, Peter Wall Institute for sponsoring my visit and tomorrow for hosting me. On for great conversations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you expect the same thing where you're looking at something where you have to constantly be scrolling up and down? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you're trying to make visual comparisons, you have to scroll. It, it basically, you know, if, if it's going to take you more than, say, 200 milliseconds to make that transition, you're going to have visual, visual working memory problems. Yeah. Um, in the video that we couldn't, didn't have sufficient minutes to see when you were showing the eye tracking with the uh, current mm -hmm. yellow circle and the mouse movements, to what extent were the mouse movements correlated with the eye movement? And what instructions were actually given to the participants? Well, they weren't. Well, the, the, the instructions were, were this, the task, right? So they're performing this task, which company in the finance sector is best. I mean, they were instructed in how the thing worked. So they, they, they kind of knew how you know, to click on things and see the links. Um, I wish you could see the kind of dialogue. <laughs> I'll have to show you later. <laughs> but uh, but, but, um, but it, there, there's, about, there's about three eye movements per mouse movement, something like that. You know, it's a, so it really is a very tight, tightly coupled behavior. You'll kind of you know, click on something, and then you'll glance up around, and then you'll click on the next one, and you'll glance, um, maybe make a couple of sack ads, and then back down and click on the next one, and so on. Are you doing some eye tracking stuff? Well, cool. It's, it's um, the particular task we asked them to do what was to click on what they're looking at. And we didn't actually do eye tracking. And I'm maybe. Yeah, there's been some work on eye tracking and visual reaching where people look at the look at the target before they, you know, before the hand gets there. So they're not following the hand, but then they may actually, you know, if you're having a series of clicks, they may actually, by the time they get there, may have actually looked at the next target. Right. Right. Um, but the, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where did you draw inspiration from these uh, visual thinking design patterns? And I ask because you mentioned design patterns, and then you mentioned, mentioned agile visualization or development. So are you drawing from the software uh, engineering? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I read the software engineering, you know, getting a four book, and I, read, I, I, I think it's in some sense it's, well, it, it has the same characteristics, I think, of both, but it's certainly not, uh, you know, isomorphic with either. It's a, 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 it just seems like the right level of, uh, I actually started talking about visual thinking algorithms, but I, that wasn't quite broad enough and didn't really capture the flavor of what, I'm, what I think is useful. I and mean, so far, I've identified about 20 of them. I mean, the key thing is, are there really, you know, I, if they're just sort of infinite variations on these things, then it may not be useful. But I, I guess I think that there, in fact, are um, patterns that are, can be identified. For example, I mean, just to give a, a flavor, of, say, another pattern would be monitoring. Right? Uh, in a monitoring task, it's all about uh, the cognitive component is an interrupt. If I, if I'm in a, in a, I have a control panel, then I, I, you're not, 
typically not monitoring false time. You you're, you're sort of need to scan this every few minutes or maybe even every few hours. Um, so you have to have some kind of either self-driven interrupt or system-driven interrupt. And, then, and, and so that's part of monitoring is, is the key part of the pattern of monitoring is, is this interrupt, uh, whether it's self-driven or system. And, and also the, 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 the visual pattern search, right? Mon visual monitoring of a control panel is about searching for a particular anomalous pattern. So you can also, you know, those are the visual queries. And so if you think in those terms, then you'll, then you'll worry about, you know, how well am I expressing the important anomalies by the display, that kind of thing. And, and maybe you also think about the scan paths. I mean, quite a bit of research has actually been done on human factors of aircraft control panels and in monitoring tasks. Yeah. Uh, so I think you described the, the, zo the zooming interface and the multiple windows as in some ways two alternatives. Uh, isn't it possible if you had a gaze contingent display to actually do, to have, say, zooming and drilling down just based on the, on the gaze information itself and not as a, as a second? Uh, yeah, the answer absolutely is yes. And, and I wish it were, I mean, the trouble with eye trackers, I mean, I, I did eye tracker research a long time ago. <laughs> and um, one of the first things I ever did when I had an academic position and I, it was actually start eye tracking. And the technology has not gotten any better. But I think it would be absolutely fantastic if you could actually look at something and it would give you at least a sniff of extra information. You know, um, but the reality is there's problems with eye trackers and you know, they, they have to be recalibrated every <laughs> few minutes. They have to be recalibrated differentially for individuals. They, there's problems with eyeglasses and eye trackers. So there seems to be no prospects of eye tracking becoming a kind of robust technology. Although absolutely what you say would be great if, if there was that prospect. I appreciate your attempt to bring cognitive science insights into your existence. But I'm wondering if by addressing the strengths and limitations of the human cognitive system, you're maybe uh, reinforcing cognitive biases um, to the extent that you know, you're, you're influencing cognitive biases like confirmation biases, that sort of thing, and how you interpret these visualizations. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to address that question. Um, so I mean, of course... In social networking, um, topology tends to end, end up bleeding into causation. So, yeah. you're drawing... Uh, yeah, I, well, I, know, I, I certainly agree with the prob problem. I mean, the problem is not general just to visualization, it's general to any kind of data analysis. I mean, this DARPA program manager that I mean, really keeps going on about, hey, you know, what, what we want is for our analysts to kind of think outside the box and see the patterns they're not looking for and, you know, all this kind of stuff, which is, but the trouble is, analytic skills is always about, you know, it's, in some sense it's about the, that is the biases, you know, your skill is the bias because that's what makes you efficient is you have certain patterns that you're, you know how to find and then you don't notice the ones that, are, but in this case, if they're novel, then, then that's, but I, I guess I, I don't know, it, it is a very general and sort of deep problem, but I don't know why, I'm not sure if it's, you can claim visualization makes it worse or better than anything else. Um, have you looked at like comparing uh, something like that, like finding patterns in that on a like printed piece of paper, like when you, people used to print stuff out and look at it, for um, computers and stuff? Um, hmm. Um, well, I, I guess I would I would think that if, if you've got the same resolution, I mean, some sometimes paper actually, you know. Actually, paper charts. People, I, one of the, I have a project called Chart of the Future Project, and, and certainly one of the things that we bemoan is the fact that electronic chart displays are very low resolution compared to paper. So paper has a huge advantage in terms of it just simply can convey more, a, a greater density of information. Except, well, now we're starting to get displays that can do that. But I wouldn't really think there would be any other fundamental differences. Yeah. Uh, did you? Notice any difference between the, comparing the zoom to the pop-up windows? If the pop-up windows are very close, or if they're very far away from each other? Um, well, these windows you could reposition. I, I, I'm not really sure. Oh, or oh, if, 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 if the windows are further apart, then you have to make longer eye movements between them, um, which you can actually measure that. But still, eye movements are still so much faster than anything else. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I do think that that's an interesting. So, you know, some people are 
extremely excited about having really big displays, which, which can in fact, of course, lead to great, greater inefficiency because now I have, because when I make an eye movement beyond, um, say, I don't know, 15 degrees or a bit more off axis, I, I really need to move my head as well. And so that, that is significantly slower, and so there are these costs associated with big eye movements, which means that actually big displays can often be <laughs> significantly less efficient than small displays, but I'm not sure. Is that the sort of thing you're getting at? Or, um, actually, one, another thing is this, you know, that, that the image I showed of um, the visual field with the fovea in the middle, one of the implications of that is this is sort of what's called the cortical magnification factor, which is the center of a visual field. It gets a lot more cortical processing than the periphery. So, in fact, you know, this is another argument against big displays because, in fact, a, a sort of normal size display gets more than, even though that only fills, you know, my visual field goes out to here, this display it, it only fills maybe 5% of my visual field. But if I'm looking at the center of it, I'm actually using kind of 50% of my visual cortex is kind of being, is devoted to that. So um, you don't actually need, which, which presumably is why things like iPhones actually work so, as well as they do. Have you done any work with uh, uh, visualizations on uh, systems where the visualization is changing in res response to real-time data? Um, or less real-time data, like the power loads or um, I personally haven't done that kind of thing. Do you have a particular problem? Uh, there may be some <laughs> other people here. You can, well, but <laughs> that would be kind of a monitoring task, right? but a real-time monitoring task, right? Maybe you could put uh, more 99 buses on in response to the number of yeah. show up. <laughs> yeah, well, in some sense, that's a, yeah. Um, but I don't think the problems are necessarily that different. Um, um, to change things in real time, or you, you still need to show the right patterns, and you need to, you know, create the right affordances so you can change, um, make the, make decisions, and, and I guess affect solutions of some kind. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on like overlapping data uh, with some form of transparency? Um, well, um, I, I've got a lot of thoughts. I'm not sure if I have any very general. I mean, you know. So map displays, of course, often use layers. And um, you know, there is no kind of free lunch. You, you can do a few things, but, but they're, they're generally rather undesirable. But you know, if you make something transparent, then um, it, it depends on the exact patterns, whether you can properly resolve them. If you have a large area of one color transparent over another color, then all you see is the blended color. You, know, you, don't really, you can't independently see the two layers. Um, you can do things like, you know, so you need to Anyway, so I've got lots of little answers. You know, in, in a sense, it's a kind of design issue. You know, you can, for example, put texture on one layer, which then lets you resolve them. Um, there's all kinds of uh, design issues, that you, uh, or des design methods for kind of trying to minimize the interference between the layers, but uh, I, I can't think of anything you can just sort of summarize in one <laughs> or two sentences. Yeah. Yeah. Have you uh, found any design patterns that aid in the uh, uh, assessment of uncertainty in the data, either in its, its representation or in, in the analyst's interpretation of uncertainty? OK, representation of uncertainty. Well, representation, it's, it's sort of funny. People are constantly getting large amounts of money to work on a representation of uncertainty. And, and at least in my, my mind, nothing very much comes of it. I mean, it, in some sense, it just, it's just one other parameter which you then have a, the problem of displaying, and of course, if you display it all the time, it's going to sort of mess up. The, you know, it, it just adds to the complexity as soon as you add to the number of dimensions. But the problem, the, well, one of the major problems with uncertainty is, is as I'm sure, if you work in the field, is it's many-dimensional. You know, there's all kinds of sources of uncertainty, and people want to. You know, there's uncertain provenance, and there's un, sort of numerical uncertainty, and there's noise, and there's um, um, and so on. Um, uh, I, I guess one observation that that. I've heard this coming from a few directions, this is not something that my own work, is, is that you shouldn't really be looking at uncertainty, you should be looking at risk. Or you should be transforming it into something that you actually, you don't care about uncertainty if you're not, you know. So you should try to show uncertainty for every variable in the display is, is, is probably impossible and, and is really going to mess it up. 
but, if, but maybe if you can sort of understand what the task in more detail and show, uh, and show risk, then you can somehow collapse uncertainty in this one variable and then try and represent that. Uh, just in designing track plot, I mean, did you look at the trade-offs between the kind of a direct visual representation of the movement pass versus something more abstract? I imagine it gets like quite busy in terms of visual field. You get a lot of movement paths, so it'd be hard to kind of aggregate and look at a lot of data that way. Um, well, it, it really only looks at one animal at a time, um, although. I expanded it to two. I've got some great mom and calf stuff. Um, but um, I mean, it has some support for that. I'm not sure about trade offs. It has support so you can, for example, you can just limit to the track to sort of a, a few seconds around the, the or, or maybe a few minutes around the current moment in time. So you, that gets rid of all that stuff in the background, those kinds of things. So it has a little bit of support. I'm actually, if, if, if I'm. <laughs> If the U.S. government can get its action order, I, I, I will probably get my O&R grant, which will actually be designed to, where I hope to look at um, some of those issues of trying to look at, um, you know, multiple, getting multiple tags on a, on, on a, many animals in a group and then trying to look at the data, but I haven't had that kind of data yet. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, when you talk about social networks, you had uh, around 500 nodes. And the links seem to be somewhat hidden until you click one and we got highlighted. Right. Did you ever do any looking to aggregation or clustering and how that affects the situation? Um. Well, clustering is certainly part of the solution. Not not in stuff I've done, but um, I, I, clustering is certainly one of the, one of the. I, I had actually a long time ago. I, um, again, when I was back in uh, Canada, I did this um, thing on 3D graphs, where we actually looked at them. They were highly clustered graphs with um, several million nodes in them. It was actually the structure of a Nortel digital switch, and uh, so you could sort of zoom in and zoom out, and, and I had five levels of clustering. Um, but I, I've since. Uh, um, I, I actually, well, anyway, I was, <laughs> it says something about the um, granting systems. Is that, uh, I, I had a strategic grant, which was, a, and, and you had to have support from industry, and both people at IBM and people at Nortel were really keen on 3D graphs. And I really actually don't think the 3D graphs are the way to go. I actually think that something that John Dill, wherever he is, <laughs> did call Intelligent Zoom was a much more sensible approach um, to, to that problem of nested um, things. But, Anyway, that's a, just a sort of general comment. And we'll, actually, in the near future, I hope to be working with nested graphs, and I'll be doing something which is much closer to what, what he did. <laughs> His company, mind you, wasn't any more successful than mine. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe he's somewhat more successful. But <laughs> didn't. I, I actually span up a company on, on that as well. The, the ocean mapping one succeeded, but the one on looking at large graphs did not succeed. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, okay, a few of them. Well, one is basically brushing, right? The, the, the basic process of brushing. So, if you brushing for those who are in the business, is uh, you've got multiple. If you've got a set of objects with multiple representations, so a classic example would be my data is um, actually. I guess I can go back. I can't. I mean, this is not live stuff, but uh, but suppose I have a a map display and some other graph display, and, and I should be able to um, select a bunch of nodes over here, and, uh, and I want to see where those nodes belong on the map. So one of, this is a node link diagram, another represent. So we have multiple representations. They get simultaneously highlighted. And that's really kind of the sort of first interactive visualization technique and still one of the best. And, um, so that's one, uh, one more uh, technique. Um, so I, I guess I'm classifying both large-scale ones, like monitoring that I sort of talked about, and um, the whole sort of analytic process of being large-scale design patterns. I think you, those are the sort of things that people characterized before. And I don't think, um, but I think most of them are at this sort of mid-level of um, just sort of the process of brushing that you're trying to compare patterns. Um, the, the one that's done in, uh, that I described at, right at the beginning, I think, is a pattern where you are basically, you've got data in a spreadsheet and you're plotting columns, 
right, in, in, in various forms, time series or scatter plots or whatever. That's, that's an, another example of a pattern. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what? What about the other ones? Oh, Tamara. Oh, okay. I'm going to give a presentation to your group on, on Monday. I'll, I'll give you the whole list then. Okay. <laughs> I'll for now. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, I have a question about the actual end user of visualization techniques. So earlier in your talk, you talked about the vertiglyphs. Uh, in oceanographic visualization, probably, and then you you showed an alternative that was perceptual bad. I wonder whether in your experience you've come across people who are very resistant to change what they used to see. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, so this is this is this is not the pattern. Well, actually, my, my favorite example. We've been doing quite a lot of work on on trying to visualize weather data, and actually, this is actually you had a question on layers. So um, I, 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 there's a design challenge, and that, it'd probably take me too long to try and find it, but I have a video of it somewhere. We decided to use these, these sort of three separate basic visual channels, low-level visual channels: motion, texture, and color. And so we decided to use color for temperature. And we, tried, we want, really want to do better than the meteorological. The, standard, the sort of standard meteorological approach will use contours for pressure, color, a color sequence for temperature, and it'll use these little glyphs called wind barbs uh, in a grid for um, wind speed and direction. And so we built something which we thought was <laughs> really superior <laughs> in every way. And I went to a, meteor, a meteorology a school for, for meteorologists um, in, in New Hampshire. And <laughs> they really <laughs> said, hey, we like the one with the wind barbs best. We really think that's the best. And <laughs> but, but then we went and well, we actually, as a result of that, because we just <laughs> I started doing an objective study of the ability to see patterns, like small circulation patterns and so on, and really showed that you simply cannot see the, these, the patterns in nearly as much detail with this representation compared to ours. Um, but anyway, that's an example of somebody who's got sort of an embedded uh, preference for, for some particular view. Hard to change. Some, some of that is that, that same bias that you were talking about earlier. They've learned yes. to, to pattern match using those particular patterns. Right. So it is hard to. They have, they have, and yeah, and sometimes they have these skills, and it, and, and and also there are real lessons there. Like, uh, you know, some people think that hey, contours are bad, and we should always use color sequences or hill shaded or whatever. But in fact, contours tell um, contours for pressure tell me winds always go um, parallel to the contours. They, they they go around the lows, and so contours actually and contour gradients are really what drive wind or pressure gradients, which come across as contour gradients. So just sort of thinking, hey, contours are bad is, is actually not correct. Contours are maybe, maybe to improve on contours, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're the, kind of the worst thing. Anyway, that's it. Yeah, so